of prayer this morning. It'll be Psalm 61. And I will read aloud from the King James Version and just ask that as you read along, let this be your prayer. You can read along or you can just let the, the spoken words speak to your heart. But we're speaking these words to the Lord in his presence. Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings, Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou will prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He will abide before God forever. O oh, prepare, he shall abide before God forever. O oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Amen. But I, by your great love, can come into your house in reverence I bow down. Thank you. 
Amen. And one of our greatest offerings that we can offer unto God is giving ourselves unto him. And our offertory scripture this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. Reading aloud from the King James Version, says, Now he that ministered seed to the sower, both minister bread for food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Amen. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave, and he demonstrated his loving is love by giving. And the best we can do is return unto him in like manner. Let us pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you honor, glory, and praise. We thank you, Father God. We reverence you. We are in awe of who you are. We are in awe of just everything that you've done for us, God. Everything that you are to us. And the fact that you are, you are eternal. Eternity exists in you because of you. So Lord, we just say thank you, Father. That you know us. That you know our names, Father. That our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So God, we just want to give you all the honor and glory. Lord, everything, we pray, Father God, that everything that's been given unto you, Father God, not unto us, but unto you, given out of love and obedience, Father God, given with a cheerful heart. Lord, we pray that you would take those things, Father God, bless it and break it, and send it out to carry out the purpose that you have for it, Father. Let it act in the life of the giver, Father, as that seed, as that kingdom seed, Lord, that will produce fruit in their lives. Fruit that would be manifested, Father God, in the form of your promises being kept that will manifest themselves in the life of the giver, Father God. In every blessing that you promise to be bestowed in their lives. So Lord, we just say thank you again for allowing us to participate in kingdom principle. Father God, which is your law of reciprocity. That we can't outgive you. We cannot outgive you. That we do not give for our deficit, but we give, Lord, simply to create more room for you to pour in. And you don't stop at the top, Lord. You overflow. You're all about exceeding abundantly above and beyond what we could ask or imagine. So, Father, we just we thank you, Lord. We receive everything that you have for us, Father, and we seek to do everything that you need for us to do for you, for your glory. We thank you for all things in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods.
Amen and amen. Just the privilege of being able to exalt our Heavenly Father. To exalt the mighty God, the one true God, the living God. To be able to exalt him, to be able to, to lift him up. As great and mighty and awesome and powerful as he is, yes, we can lift him up. We can place him above. We can place him above the highest thing in our lives. Not just above the highest, but in the very center of our lives. Because that's where we want him to really be. He is the highest. He is the mightiest. He is above everything. Jesus is the name above every name. But it's when we have him in the center of our lives. In the center of our lives. That we can begin to experience him in the fullness of, of who he is. Amen. Our scripture this morning is really an awesome testimony of the power of God's word and who he is and just the when I study, when I read his word I never know how God is going to manifest it when he's going to bring it out how he's going to bring it out and there are times when I'm just studying and reading not in preparation of a sermon but just Lord, what does your word say? And I'm going through, and, and God will give me a word. He'll give me a sermon. He'll give me a whole message, and I'll just go through it. And I'm thinking it's for a certain Sunday, and I'm thinking it's for a certain time. And he'll kind of like put it behind the door and lock it <laughs> so that I can't get to it in my own time, so I can't get to it when I think, I, I think it's time for that. But... As I'm reading through and I go through and, and, and I read a verse and I read a scripture. And it's like that scripture is the key that unlocks all that previous study. <laughs> and today was one of those days. Today was one of those days. I, I, I read the, the U version app. And the verse was 1 Peter 5 and 10. And it was like as I read it. It was the key. That was the key that opened the door to that previous <laughs> message and study that God had, 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 had dropped within my spirit. So that's where we're coming from today. It's not that, well, yeah, it, that, it's that he, he changed the message from what I had actually been preparing all week. But in what he gave me is already in. It's already been addressed and it's already actually kind of what we've been talking about anyway as far as because last week we talked about Jesus the Prince of Peace and the Prince of Peace in him being the Prince of Peace and him being the Prince of at oneness of him being the, the Prince of us being able to have that spirit of calm through conflict this is right in line with that 1 Peter 5, 10. And it says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, settle you. And verse 11 says, To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And it's just, again, that was, that was just the key for, today, for today's message that was, that was locked away for, for, for such a time as this, you know, as, as the Holy Spirit has so led. But in 1 Peter 5.10, when we read through that, I find sometimes that I myself and, 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 and I believe a lot of believers as a whole, we read through this and we get stuck on a certain phrase in there. I think you already know what I'm talking about. But we get stuck, stuck on. After that, you have suffered a while. We get stuck on it. We get fixated on it. Because it involves that word, suffer. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to suffer. Nobody, nobody 
puts it on their things, list of things to do today, suffering. I know I never do. But again, that, that suffering, when we focus on that, when we fixate on that, and that, that, that suffering, the next thing we think of, well, 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 how long is a while? Is it a little while? Is it a long while? Is it a short while? Is it a major while? It's a while. How long is while? And we don't even look at our watch as far as how long a while is. We we think we're thinking calendar. We're thinking flipping days, flipping months. On the what? What is a while? I don't, Lord, I don't mind suffering if, if, if I can measure it on my watch. But but you know that that's I can I can kind of bear that. But 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 if I have to start flipping calendar days, then then Lord, we we I'm, I'm, I might want to try to negotiate through this. Can we get around this somehow? Uh, can we can we shorten it? Can we can can I can I bargain? for it to be shorter. But as we read the whole verse, I'm going to read through it one again. It says, but the God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that ye have suffered a while make you perfect, establish strengthen and settle you. This this verse to me is a dichotomy. It's a it's a summation of basically how God does things. The entirety of our of our walk as a Christian, the entirety of the word itself, because we know that God knew the end from the beginning. He is eternal. He is Alpha and Omega. He is beginning and the end. He has no beginning and he will have no end. So everything that exists, everything that has a beginning and an end does so within the bounds of who God is. Does so within the bounds of what God allows. And this verse simply just the whole chapter of the whole book of first Peter is written to scattered Christians throughout. They're scattered throughout. If we go back to chapter one, verse one, first Peter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So the believers have been scattered. And Paul's writing this letter to them to be circulated among them. And he, the entirety of the letter is an encouragement. It's a reminder to them. It's a reminder and an encouragement of just different things. Because in the beginning, he, he, he starts talking about salvation. Wrought by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Then he's then there's a call to Christian dedication. Then there's a reminder in there of, of Christ being the living stone. He speaks to us. This, this, is, this is the chapter that contains, this is the book that contains. But we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. And then we're encouraged to live as servants of God. Then there's an example of Christ's suffering. There's an encouragement to husbands and wives in their um, suffering and reward. So it's an encouragement to these, to the believers, to the scattered believers that what's going on, you know, there's something greater than what's going on in your life already. Your life has purpose, and that all this stuff that's going on around it is, is secondary to, to, to what we have in our life. Chapter 4 is actually titled in my Bible, Good Stewards of God's Grace. Good Caretakers of God's Grace. But chapter 5 and verse 10. Peter 
to me hits the nail on the head with this, with this one verse. And he starts, and he, he starts out just in this one verse. He says, but the God of all grace, comma. Think about what he's saying right there. But the God of all grace. Remember what the word says about grace. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. God's grace gave grace. Grace comes from the Greek word charis, C H A R I S, charis. And it means graciousness, it means acceptable. It's a benefit, a favor, gift, joy, liberality, pleasure, and thanks. But grace is us receiving something that we did not deserve. Us receiving something that we did not deserve, salvation. For it is by grace, for it is by God's ministering of something that we did not deserve that we are saved. We could not earn salvation. If it was something we could have earned, then Jesus really didn't need to go to the cross for us. But because we could not earn it on our own, but because, and that was how God designed it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And a, an example of that, would be think about it if we were in a, in a tall building, in a room in a tall building, and we accidentally somehow start a fire. The room is on fire. Now our life is in jeopardy. And we can't get out the door to go use the elevator, can't get out the door to go use the stairs. The only way out is through this window we have to jump out the window to the down where the firemen are holding the, the trampoline thing. I don't know what they call that. <laughs> but we have to go through the window and land in that. Think of salvation is the getting out of the room, the saving our life. Grace is the trampoline thing that's going to catch us. But in order to get, we have to have, we have to go through faith. We have to go through that window. For it is by grace that you are saved. Through faith. You have to go through the window to get down to grace. So we have to, we have to exercise our faith to get to grace. But grace is what saves us. Grace is what saves us. And our faith is what so so grace God's grace God is grace but the God of all grace that's why we sing amazing grace how sweet the sound and all the verses that there are to that and all the other uh, uh, just the meaning behind it God's grace that saving grace is so amazing simply because Jesus took on every sin from Adam until his return. The first Adam and the second Adam. Every sin that took place. He took upon himself. So that we can experience the fullness of God's grace through faith. There's a grace by him. But the God of all grace. Who have called us unto his eternal glory so we experience his grace but the God of all grace but the God who created us because he wanted fellowship with us because he wanted the Christ centered the Christ based fellowship intimacy of fellowship with us but the God of all grace, who has called us into his eternal glory. Into his eternal glory. When I think of, 
of, of God's glory. How it rests upon us. When I think of, of God's glory, the glory of who he is, his glory is no light thing. His glory is not a second fiddle to who God is because when, when Moses asked, show me your face. When, when God said, Moses, ask whatever you want. And Moses said, show me your face. And God said, no, you cannot. I will put you in the cleft of the rock. I will put my hand over the, the space and I will pass by. And you can see the backside of my glory. The, just the backside. He couldn't handle the fullness of God's glory. Moses, in the presence of God, as God scribe, as God imparted the Ten Commandments unto him, being in the presence of God, I get I'm getting goose pimples right now just thinking about it. Just Moses being in the presence of God, and he when he came down the mountain, he had to be veiled because God's glory rested so strongly upon him. He was handling it. He could because he had spent that time in the presence of God and God knew that he, God gave Moses what he could handle. But in Moses having what he could handle, one person in the presence of God, the children of Israel couldn't handle what Moses had on him so much that he had to be veiled to go back down into their presence. This is the glory of God. This is what he called us into. This is what rests upon us as his children. We don't put it on daily. It rests upon us. It rests upon us. And when we walk in the faith and the confidence of who God is, our outward appearance is skewed, is covered, is over transposed by his glory. Our outer garments, our physical appearance, all these things are covered by his glory. We can go into a place covered by God's glory. And people will see us and really not notice what it is that we're wearing. They will see us and they really won't even might not even recognize our, uh, us by the, the look on our face. But they will know that the glory of God is resting upon us. Unbelievers can feel this. Unbelievers can feel the glory of God. We've had people come into our home <laughs> where the glory of God rests. And some can readily identify. But others have not been able to just say what it is, but they say that there's something about this place. And it's not because of anything we do. It's not because of anything we try, anything we plan, anything we contrive. But it's simply the glory of God that rests upon his children, that rests upon his believers. The glory of God, but, but the God of all grace who have called us into his eternal glory. Into his, his glory does not fade. His glory. Me being a big sports fan, I think of like athletes. And as an athlete reaches his peak, he's at the fullness of his glory. And people think back of when he first started, oh, he couldn't do this, he couldn't do all of that, but then he got better, and now he's at the peak, and this is all he can do. But then when he gets to the end of his career, when, 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 the, when the talent and the skills have begun to fade, and he might be still as good, he can't do all the things that he could do at his peak, but he can still, but he's transformed his game to where he's now doing this, and he's, he's even better, but he's not at the height, he's not at the fullness of his glory, but he's still good because he can still do all these things. Then they retire. 
10, 15, 20 years later. And he thinks back to his glory days. His fans refer back to the glory days. Oh, do you remember when he could? Oh, he was so good. And they might even say that while he's still playing sometimes. But guess what? We never have to say that about God's eternal glory. We've never had to say that. Well, do you remember when God used to be able to? We don't look, we don't read back in Genesis and think, wow, that was awesome when God could do that. We don't read Revelation and, and, and all the things that God talks about doing, and, and we don't read, we don't we didn't read First Peter and think, oh wow, it was awesome when God could do that. God's eternal glory allows us to say, oh, thank God for what you did. Thank God for what you're doing and thank, thank you for what you're about to do. What you're going to do, what you've spoken, what you've promised. We look back at what he's done and say, oh my God, <laughs> thank you, Lord, that you're doing that and that because you spoke it and said that because you spoke what you spoke into my life. It's going to happen? What? What? Who? if you did it before, you can do it again. Because you did it before, you can do it again. Same God right now, same God back then. Oh, he is so good. That is the strength and the beauty of his eternal glory. The strength and the beauty of his eternal glory. But the God of all grace, but the God who graced us with salvation, all is a part of his plan, who called us into his eternal glory to be covered in his eternal glory. By Christ Jesus, Obviously, in that moment when he said, let us create man in our image, knowing that it would require the Christ's sacrifice, knowing that it would require the earthly manifestation of himself in flesh form, the Christ to walk this earth for 33 years, to be planted, germinated and grown for 30 years, to pop up, break soil, and to minister, to grow and bear fruit for three years, then to be cut down, only to rise again and ascend back into heaven with God. He knew that that was going to have to happen and Christ did it anyway. And Christ coming to this earth for 33 years, having to wear a sinful flesh, a sinful flesh that he subdued, a sinful flesh that he had power over, that he exercised control over, but had to exercise control over. The Christ that came down from resting within the bosom of the Father that came here to walk this earth, to be constantly challenged, to be constantly questioned, to be constantly set snares for, <laughs> by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees, by the scribes, by all those who feared his power, who feared the loss of their own influence, power, and authority in the land, for him to come down having all power in his mouth, having all power in the substance of who he was, endured the beatings, endured the abuse, physical, mental, emotional, otherwise endured all of that, 
endured 39 lashes, endured ridicule on the cross, endured the physical pain, endured the anguish, so that we so that we could be called sons of God, so that we could be called co-heirs with him, so that we wouldn't have to go through any of that. So that we could be called into God's eternal glory. For, for that, Jesus suffered a while. So that we could have all of that. Jesus suffered a while. We call it 33 years suffering because why? He was out of heaven. Heaven was bankrupt of his presence. That's, he suffered a while. For the time that he was physically persecuted to the time he breathed his last on the cross, we could say he suffered a while. in the moment that he took on every sin from the garden to his return and God, heavenly, holy father had to turn his back on him, had to forsake him. We could say Jesus suffered a while so that we could have all that we have, so that we would know the God of all grace, so that we could experience his eternal glory. Jesus suffered a while. But in that in that coming back to the verse, but the God of all grace who had called us into his eternal glory by Jesus Christ after that ye have suffered for a while, anything that we have endured, anything that we are enduring, anything that we consider as suffering. Suffering. And the word suffering actually comes from the Greek word, and there's three words for it that are all the same. Pasco, P-A-S-C-H-O. Patho, P-A-T-H-O. Or Pentho, P-E-N-T-H-O. Suffering. And it, seem, and it means to, to experience a sensation or an impression. Usually negative. It means to feel It means the, the passion, what we refer to the, the passion of the Christ, everything that he, he went through, the passion. It means to suffer, obviously, and it means to vex. So whenever we face hardship, trial, tribulation, persecution, rejection, if we suffer any of the things that, that, we, that we put under the category of suffering, when we go through those things, God always has reason for it. Jesus, There was even reason for Jesus to go through it. Number one, for us. So that we could experience the God of all grace. So that we could be called into his eternal glory so that we could call him Abba Father, Daddy God like Jesus did, does. Did or does. But he also went through it so that his name could be exalted above every name. He also went through it so that he could become our source of hope. He endured all of that. And we remember that Jesus said but I have overcome the world. 
So that gives us a hope. That gives us a, 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 a marker in the storm. That's our lighthouse in the storm that whenever it rages, guess what? It can't do anything greater to us than Jesus allows. Than God allows for it to do. That it has purpose. But God also has a purpose for us to go through anything and everything that it is that we go through, that we endure, that we experience. Because he's the potter and we're the clay. He's the creator and we are the creation. But as believers, we've transformed from creation to children. But we're still clay in his hands. We're still clay that needs to be formed. We're still clay that needs to be molded, shaped. When we get to this verse, when we read through this verse, and in our focusing and fixating on suffering a while, we don't want to suffer. And if we should have to, endure suffering. We don't want it to be for a long time. We don't want it to, we don't want it to last very long. We, we, want to, we want to say when it ends. But in, fo in, in focusing on it and fixating on it, we miss, we miss the God of all grace. We miss being called in his eternal glory by Jesus Christ. But we also miss what God does in us, to us, for us, and through us. Because after, amen. We miss the result. We miss the setup. The setup is, but the God of all grace. The setup is that we've been called into his eternal glory. But it's, it's, not, a, it's not an initiation. It's not a stamping on your card. It's not a stamp on the back of your hand so you can get into the, into the, to the, to the dance or whatever. This is the process by which God is making us. This is the process by which God is doing what it is he does. And what, 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 what is it that he does with us through our suffering for a little while? What is it that he does? Continuing on. That after, after that you have suffered a while, but the God of all grace who hath called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that ye have suffered a while that he make you perfect. What does it mean to be perfect? Does it mean to be flawless? Does it mean to be? No, it does not. It means to be, it comes from the, the, the Greek word katartizo, K-A-T-A-R-T-I-Z-O, katartizo. And it means to complete thoroughly. To complete thoroughly. It means to repair. To fix or to adjust. To fit. To frame. To mend. To make perfect, to perfectly join together, to prepare, or to restore. So, in our suffering for a while, God is looking to make us perfect. Our relationship with him was broken. In order for something to be broken, to be fixed, the broken pieces have got to be reassembled. For a, a vase, a jar, uh, a car, anything, anything inanimate, anything without life, you're just putting the pieces back together, the car feels nothing because the car has no feelings. When we break a bone, <laughs> that bone has got to be set and that resetting can be painful. If we don't reset it, reset it properly, this body is made to mend. And if that bone is not set properly and aligned properly, it's going to heal, but it's going to heal disjointedly. It's going to be healed incorrectly. 
and it, it'll be misaligned. You might have to be rebroken and reset, but the setting of that bone, the, the setting of it so that it can bend properly sometimes hurts. Worse than the actual breakage. <laughs> but there has to be. And this is what God is looking to do as we suffer the things that we suffer. As we go through, as we endure, as we experience as we have the sensation, as we have the feelings, as we, as we have the passion, as, we, as we're vexed, as we are, God uses this to make us complete. Complete thoroughly, to complete thoroughly. That means when, when God has finished it with us, our puzzle will have all the pieces. There will be no gaps. <laughs> that means when he, when he finishes us, there will be no leftover parts. We will be complete thoroughly. So he's gonna, he's gonna make us perfect. He's gonna make us perfect. But he's also gonna establish us. Establish us. And establish, it comes from the, the Greek word sterizo, S-T-E-R-I-Z-O, sterizo. And it means to, to set fast, to turn resolutely in a certain direction. It means to confirm. It means to fix. It means to steadfastly set. And it means to strengthen. So what we have so far is that God is, is trying to make us. He's trying to, now he's, he's not trying, he's doing. He is completely and thoroughly repairing us, adjusting us, fixing us. He is setting us Fast. He is turning us resolutely in a certain direction. When I read that part of the definition, I always think about how we sing the song, how he picked me up and turned me around and placed my feet on solid ground. That's all that that is. He picked me up and he, and he turned me around. He turned me to face him because as I, 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 I don't fall into that place where I need him like that, facing him. Facing him with my attention fixed straightly on him. I don't fall into those places, but when I when, when when my attention turns from him, when my face or my posture turns from him, my direction turns from him, then he's got to pick me up and he's got to turn me resolutely in a certain direction. And in that certain direction is back to him. Resolutely, resolutely is that he is focused and that he is purposeful in what he is doing. And he is purposefully, resolutely turning me back to him. If you've ever watched a parent, it may not happen so much today, but I remember back in the day <laughs> when a child was acting up in public or you was at your friend's house and your friend was cutting up and, 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 and mom or dad came into the room and that person needed a shaking, they, they would grab that person and put him right in the face. Even if you're shaking them, <laughs> it was right in the face so that you're facing them so that you can see, so that they can see the resoluteness of your face so that they can see the expression on your face to let them know I'm serious. Do you need to be looking at me to understand what I'm saying to you for your good so you don't have to go through this again. So you don't have to get worse than this the next time you mess up. And that's what, that's what all the facial expression and everything else is telling them. Even though you're holding them firmly turning them resolutely in a certain direction. And that certain direction is so that you can be face to face now. But God is resolutely. And this, and this is what the suffering does. It turns us to him. It turns us to him. It is not punishment. His punishment, he is specific about his punishment. And he is informative about his punishment. We don't have to try to figure out a guess if God is punishing us or not, because he will let us know. He's not that abusive parent. He's not an abusive parent. 
An abusive parent would just come in beaten for no reason. Because they don't feel good. Because something's wrong inside of them. That's where, that's where th that level of abuse comes from. God is not like that. God said, if you being sinful know how to be a good parent, how much more am I able to be? But all of this that, that he's allowing us to go through is not punishment. We need to stop looking at the, the hardship, the, the suffering for a while as if God has done something. If we've done something to make God mad. If we do something to make God mad, we will know. He will let us know. The Holy Spirit will say, uh, you done messed up now. That's why he's in there. Oh, you did it now. We know, we know, we know. When we veered from God's word, we know. It's no, it, there's no accident. Well, I didn't know the words that you know, you know. You know. He holds us accountable for the things <laughs> that we know. But in this suffering, in, in, in suffering for a little while, for a little while, he's, he's making us perfect and he's establishing us, he's setting us fast. It also says that he is strengthening us. Suffering strengthens us. Experiencing sensations, experiencing these impressions, feeling these things, having the passion, being vexed, it strengthens us. Why? Because the God of all grace has called us into his eternal glory. So anything that we are in him experiencing, guess what? It's for our strengthening. It's for our strengthening. Strengthening comes from the Greek word stainou. S-T-H-E-N-O-O. Stainou. Stainou. Keep that stand up. But it means to confirm in spiritual knowledge and power to confirm in spiritual knowledge and power. We are strengthened. We are confirmed in spiritual knowledge and power when we can endure that suffering for a while, but we do so knowing that the God of all grace has called us into his eternal glory. We are strengthened. We are confirmed in spiritual knowledge and power. When we can go through those things, thanking the God of all grace because he has called us into all, into his eternal glory. Knowing that the God of all grace, the God of all grace has called us in, knowing that even though we're suffering for a while, that's not our lot. That God is our lot. Suffering is not our lot in life because this life is not our lot. Remember, suffering is not our lot in life because this life is not our lot. Just that Jesus came down from heaven, lived the time that he did down here, died, was resurrected, and ascended back up into heaven, the time we spend on this earth is not our lot. Like the garden wasn't intended to be it. This time that we, as, as human beings, as, 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 as eternal souls resting within human temporal bodies is not our lot. Our lot is eternity with God. Our lot is eternity with God. Here's a little sidebar where the word says that we are predestined that we are predestined is God's intended destiny that every breathing soul spend eternity with him. That's what his desire is. 
but those who die without receiving Jesus miss their destiny. Miss their destiny. They step off the bus. They get off the bus. They get off the train. They fall off the train. They fall off the mean because God intend that that that's the predestined. Predestined doesn't mean pre-programmed. Predestined doesn't mean predetermined. Predestined means that that is God. That is our destiny. That's what was purposed for us to do. From creation, from let us create man in our image. That's predestined. Not predetermined, not pre programmed. God didn't want religious robots. He wanted relationship, and relationship is by choice. And that's what He wants for us. And that's what makes grace. Because we have to receive grace. If He programs, if He pre programs us, there's no need for grace. If He pre programs us, then we can't fully experience his eternal glory. So he's making us perfect. He's establishing us. He is strengthening us. And finally, and finally, he's settling us. He's settling us. Settling us, settling us, settle, settle. It comes from the Greek word themelio, T H E M E L I O O. Themelio, themelio. And it means to settle, it means to lay a basis. It means to erect or to build. It means to consolidate. It means to ground. It means to lay a foundation. Mm -hmm. Our suffering for a while lays a basis lays a basis for us. It erects us. It builds us. It consolidates us. It grounds us. And it lays a foundation for us. Settle. Settle. Think about it. What does the word say? But when we give, that press down, shaking together, guess what that is? Settling. That's settling. That's why, that's why, when we buy a bag of potato chips in the factory, the bag goes and the chips go in and it, 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 it's full. But as it moves down the line and as it transports everywhere, the potato chips settle. So in there you got almost as much air as you do potato chips. But it's filled by volume. That's what it says. But you're still buying almost more air than chips. Anyway, anyway, the point is that they that they settled. That they settled. You pour jelly beans into a jar, you can shake it around, get them to settle, and you get some more in there. You pour grain into a bag, like they used to do back in the day. You pour it in and you shake it. So that it's settled, so you can get more in there. You settle it. God settles us. He shakes us. We suffer for a little while. He shakes us, and we settle. And guess what? He can pour more in. <laughs> he shakes us to settle us. The suffering, it shakes us. It does. Going through things and experience those things, it does shake us. It's not a punitive kind of shake. It's not a get it right kind of shake. But it's a let me make more room kind of shake. Because God pours in, press down, shaking together, and I cut it off right there. But his word says, and running over. And running over. So he's just not... 
pouring in until it until it goes. He's getting in as much as he can. That's in there. Shaking it. Press down. Press down. Press down. You, you with a garbage bag? In that garbage can? You try to squeeze as much as you can in there. Most because you don't be taking out the trash every day. <laughs> so, 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 but, but, but you're trying to squeeze as much as you can down in there. Why? So you can get more in there. So you can get, so he's shaking us. He's settling us. Settling us. So the houses, when you build a house, when a house is constructed, that house begins to settle over time. The ground underneath the foundation will begin to settle. Sometimes it cracks the foundation, which will cause cracks in the house. But, but that house is going to begin to settle in the transition time, in spring and, and fall. When you're transitioning from the cold to the hot or the hot to the cold and your house will start creaking, that's because things are expanding and contracting, settling. And you can hear it sometimes. You hear your house creaking, span, expanding, and contracting sometimes. But it's, it's settling. It's settling. And it's only going to do that over time. It's going to do that over time. It's going to do that with the transition of seasons. God is settling us when we suffer. After you have suffered a while. This is the purpose of for suffering. So when we go through a hard time, when we experience that trial, that tribulation, when we experience that persecution, when we experience that rejection, when we experience that 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 sensation, that impression, that feeling, that passion, that vexation that goes on in our lives, when we do that, God is strengthening us. He's making us perfect. He's establishing us and he's settling us. And he's doing all of that for his purpose and for his glory. And he's doing all that so that the next time we go through, it won't be as difficult. He's strengthening us for the next time. When we work out with weights, when a person works out with weights, and you're, and you're lifting the weights and you're lifting the weights, the way you get, make bigger muscle is that your muscles tear. You're lifting the weights and your muscles tear. And then the healing, the, 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 the filling in of the tears in the muscles, that's what makes the muscles bigger. That's what makes the muscles stronger. The tearing, the working out, the lifting. That's what? Amen. Yeah. But here we go. But, 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 because, but it takes that lifting it takes that stretching it takes that your muscles have to suffer when you finish working out you got you got you got to stretch you got to cool down and all of that but you're still going to feel it you're going to know that you worked out you're going to know and if you allow that feeling that pain that to say okay well that's enough I'm done that that hurts that doesn't feel right that doesn't feel good I'm done you're never going to get to that goal you're never going to get to that goal you're never going to get to that goal. But God's goal is to get us into heaven with him. God's goal is that we make it through this life without falling, without suffering. Not without suffering. Without falling. Without falling away. Let's turn real fast and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. We already have the Apostle Peter talking about God, the God of all grace. And now in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse 9. Verse 12. Now we're in 12, verse 9. 
And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. This is, the, this is Jesus speaking to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul had, remember what, his, remember what his story was. As Saul, he persecuted the church. As Saul, he had credentials. As Saul, he had social status. As Saul, he had all of these things. He had carte blanche to go persecute Christ. He had all of that. As Saul, he had no thorn in his side. He had no restraints. He could go do whatever he felt like he needed to do. All he had to do was tell the governor, the regent, whoever was in charge, that I'm going to go here, I'm going to do this, and, and, and he would get the stamp. He would get the approval for whatever he needed. And for whatever he needed. But he thought that he was doing what he was doing in the name of God. He thought that he was serving God and doing what he was doing. Once he met Jesus, his direction turned. That's the only thing that got changed about him. His zeal was still the same. His character was still the same. Everything about him was still the same except his direction. Christ now was on the inside. Christ was no longer the target. He didn't realize Christ was the target. But when Christ went from being the target to on the inside, now Saul is, 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 is pressing on with the same zeal, with the same fervor. And instead of persecuting Christ, now he's promoting Christ. Instead of persecuting the believers, now he's Encouraging more believers. See, without, without a thorn, Paul persecuted Christ. Saul persecuted Christ for Saul's glory. After the thorn, because it says, he says, a thorn was given unto me. Verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. There was a thorn given unto Saul, or excuse me now, Paul. Saul, with no thorn, persecuted Christ for his own glory. Although he thought he was persecuted, although, although he thought he was promoting God, although he thought Saul was persecuting Christ for, for Saul's glory. With a thorn, Paul now shared Christ for God's glory. And the thorn served to keep him humble. The thorn served to keep him focused on God. The thorn served to keep him reminded that he needed God. That he needed the Jesus that he was now promoting. That it, it, it always kept him reminded that without the one who now is the purpose, who is now the central focus of what I'm telling all these people, without him, this thorn is going to take me out. This thorn is going to hinder me. This thorn is going to stop me. But in spite of this thorn, in spite of this thorn, Paul was strengthened. He was settled. He was perfected. And he was established by the storm. By the storm. He suffered because of the storm. But because of that thorn. Because of that thorn. And, and, and it, it wasn't because of the thorn. It was because God's grace. He said, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my grace is sufficient for thee. Say, as Peter said, but the God of all grace. Who invited us. Who called us into his eternal glory. Is allowing us to do all of these things so that he can. And Paul is here saying that Jesus let him know that my grace is sufficient. So two different apostles getting the same message about grace. That's the Holy Spirit letting us know that, uh, that there's, there's, there's going to be those times. We're going to suffer certain things. Some of us, everybody doesn't have a thorn in their side. Everybody doesn't have a thorn in their side. But for the ones whom God is going to give a significant assignment into, into what they're doing, they might need that thorn. They might need that thorn. And it's not punishment. It wasn't, that thorn wasn't punishment. That thorn was to keep him grounded. That thorn was to keep him settled. That thorn was to keep him focused. Thorn was to keep him focused. Paul didn't have a problem 
with focus per se, but he had to, he, he had a problem keeping his focus on God. Because he was he was a religious leader, he was taught, he was taught, but when the truth of Christ came to him before Christ before Christ revealed himself to him, he rejected it. So he had, he needed that thorn to keep him focused on Christ. So that he wouldn't lose that. But in going back to um, First Peter, going back to First Peter, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make ye perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle ye. All these things have purpose. All these things have purpose. And the purpose is so that God can make us into that strong. Make us into that effective. Make us into that immovable. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the works of the Lord. Steadfast and immovable. That's what God needs us to be. That's what God needs us to be. Because the, the moment, the moment we turn away from that, whatever it is that turned us away, the enemy's going to note that. And he's going to continue throwing that very thing in your path. That very thing in your path. And every time you veer to avoid it, every time you veer, you're turning that much further away from God. Every time you try to go around it, every time you try to go over it, and instead of facing it, instead of conquering it, instead of overcoming it, Jesus said, for I've overcome the world. So we remember, we remember that the God of all grace who called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus then those obstacles, those walls become speed bumps. And pretty soon those speed bumps will be just be like the lines in the road. They won't slow us. They won't, turn, they won't turn us. They won't hinder us. They won't deter us. Because if we're strong enough in Christ, if we're strong enough in Christ because of all the things that we've endured, because of what we're going through, because we're able to go through and remember that the God of all grace has called us into his glory. It's his glory that rests upon us, that allows us to do the things that we do. His grace that saved us through faith, that is perfecting us, that is establishing us, that is strengthening us, that is settling us. This is the life that God has for us. This is the life that God called us into. Even jumping back to last week, the life of peace, the life of calm through conflict. Because we've been strengthened, because we've been perfected, because we've been established, because we've been settled, the God of grace and, and his glory, there's, there's, there's not a whole lot the enemy can throw before us. There's not a lot that he can throw before us. Jesus, he's the, the, the living rock, the living stone. And, Jesus, and, and, and he told Peter, would he tell Peter that, the, that the, on, this, on this rock I will build my, my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it? The church is unstoppable. We are unstoppable. The gates of hell cannot prevail against us. We are unstoppable. The only thing that can stop ourselves is us. But we remove that obstacle when we, when we rely on the God of all grace. I'm going to read it one last time and we're going to close with the word of prayer. But the God of all grace, who have called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and sell me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we give you all honor, all glory, and all praise. Because they are due your name, Lord. And we can do no better. God, as we have purpose in our hearts that we would gather during this time to honor you, to worship you, to praise you, Father God, to hear what thus saith the Lord, we thank you, O oh God. 
we thank you that just as much as we purpose that we would gather to worship you, that we would come forward, that we would empty ourselves of ourselves, that we would come into your presence, Lord. It was your desire as well to be in our midst. You didn't promise it without the expectation that we would do our part. You promised in knowing, Father God, that somewhere someone would. And Lord, it pleases us. It pleases us to be found. To be found worshiping you. It pleases us, Father God, to do as you desire, Lord. To gather in your name so that you be found in our midst. It pleases us, dear God, to be pleasing unto you. We're not trying to please men, Father, but we want to please you. So, God, we just thank you, oh Lord, for this opportunity. Not just this opportunity, Lord, but the ability to do so, dear God. We thank you, Father, that even in the inability to gather physically, dear God, that you, you've given us, you've given us the means where we can do so. In a manner, God, where you come in and you fill the space. You come in the distance. But we're unified in spirit. Socially distanced, God, but unified in you. We just say thank you, Father. Thank you for this time of worship, Lord. Thank you, dear God. For all who attended, for all who may have tuned in, but thank you, Father, for all who just purposed in their hearts that they would worship you today. God, we just thank you. We, we ask, dear God, that as we, again, prepare to transition our worship from the corporate to the individual. That you would just continue to manifest your presence. Continue to affirm your word in the lives of those who seek you. And for those who don't know you, Father, those who are not seeking you, dear God, we pray that you would just send your word in in such a subtle way that would just touch their hearts and move upon their hearts, Lord, and bring them to the point of decision to where they have to decide. Do I, do I not want to know the God of all grace? Do I want to receive the call into your eternal glory? Father, it's our prayer, even as it is, as it is your desire, that they would answer in the affirmative. prayerfully to God, that when they do, we will, we will rejoice with the saints. We will rejoice with the angels in heaven, Father, over one more soul. So we just thank you, Father. Thank you for your edge of protection around us. Thank you for your promise to never leave us nor forsake us, Father God. Thank you, dear God. Thank you, Lord, that we're able to be called your children those of us who receive Christ as Lord and Savior. We pray, Father, for those who, who haven't. Strengthen us, embolden us, and encourage us, Lord, to share your word. Not to just make converts, Lord, but to make disciples. And with all of that, dear God, we just say we thank you, Lord. We thank you for all things in Jesus' name, Father. Amen.